This is the Adopted Mom Podcast. Adoption may look different for each family, but we need solidarity from other crazy people who took this leap. And that is what we do here. We encourage, we build up, we share the wins and losses. We lean on each other and we get through this together. Thanks for joining us. Hey everyone, welcome to episode six of the Adoptive Mom Podcast. I am loving hearing your comments and all of the feedback I'm getting about the show. It's so much fun to do and I really want to keep it up. So keep that feedback coming. Keep rating and reviewing us on iTunes. And if you have anyone that you think should be on the show, be sure and let me know. I would love to keep your ill your ears filled with episodes of women who have lots of wisdom to share, whether you're an adoptive mom yourself or you just support people who do or have some great advice to give. I want to hear from you. So this episode is going to be a little bit different. It's from someone who has not adopted, but is all up in the adoption game regardless. And she is also my mother. And she has been in this adoption game with us from day one, and she's grown and learned right alongside us. And she is also an adoptive attorney in this area. And so she is super familiar with the process and what it looks like because she also lives like five minutes away. So she's she's around this all the time. And so if you are any kind of support system, but specifically if your kids are going through this crazy adoption thing, then you want to listen to this episode. She has lots of wisdom to share and she's really funny too. So you definitely want to hear it. So um, let's jump right into my episode with Andrea McCurdy, aka mom. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Adoptive Mom Podcast. As I said, I am here with my mom, actually, in this interview. And that might seem a little weird, but I really feel like... um, She's been with us through this whole process and she's gotten to where she really knocks it out of the depart out of the park in the support department. So I felt like everyone could really um stand to hear her story and how she's felt through all of this and how she feels now and just what it feels like to be on the support side of this crazy adoption thing. So hey mom. Hey. <laughs> uh are you a little weirded out about being on your daughter's podcast? Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, I mean, I already know everything, but tell uh, all the listeners a little bit about yourself and your kids and what you do and all that stuff. All right. Well, um, I have uh, your Alex is, our, is the oldest of our three kids. We have three, and um, Alex is the oldest girl. Then we have Cameron in the middle, and then Sierra is the youngest. And we homeschooled most of their lives. Or in Alex's case, she kind of homeschooled herself. <laughs> <laughs> and Sierra was definitely not an accident, right? That's exactly right. She's our surprise blessing. <laughs> <laughs> and we, uh, I'll tell you what, having three kids and having them, having Sierra come later has really taught us that had just the the joy of, of seeing how every kid, everybody is made so different. All kids are so different. There's no way to parent them the same. And you definitely love them as much, but love them differently. So it's been a good learning experience that way. Um, I, I'm a, an attorney, a local attorney here in Northwest Arkansas. I um, do mostly family law and some criminal defense. And uh, that uh, takes up a little more time in my life than I'd like for it to take. I wish I had more time to spend with uh, grandkids and family. But um, I also look at it kind of as a ministry. If I can, if I can have people that come to me to get divorced, and I can refer them out to great uh, marriage counselors, and they will work things out and stay married, I consider that a, a, a success and a great day. And so far, I just kind of keep account of of you know how successful God allows me to be in reaching those people. And so I'll kind of look at it as a ministry and. Um, Every day is kind of a different day, but um, that's what I do. I do a lot of a lot of adoptions, a lot of family law, um, and uh, you know the best day always is when you get to do an adoption. So I really that's kind of my heart, and uh, I wish that's all I did. I wish I could do just just things like that. But anyway, that's kind of what I do in a nutshell. And oh, I'm blessed enough to live close to you guys. And, uh, so we get to see the kids as much as we can and, um, and see y'all. Yes. Yes. And you're married to dad. 
married to dad. Uh, yes. And um, to people who are not us, he's known as. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it, John McCurdy. And he is uh, he is a network guy. And we're blessed enough to I, my my law firm rents law, rents uh, office space from the company he works for. So we get to see each other every day at work. And we're maybe one of the few couples that really enjoy spending time together and like seeing each other, I think, <laughs> during the day. <laughs> and working together that way. So um, we are just a super close-knit family and wouldn't have it any other way. And we feel like uh, God has really blessed us in that regard. Awesome. And, you know, I really want everyone to hear just, I feel like um, in regards to this whole adoption thing, your life has really come full circle because you have not always been an attorney. In fact, um, my mom is kind of my superhero because she went – back to college um, whenever I was finishing up high school. And then we were actually in college together before she went to law school for one year. We had a class together. And um, my rebellious mother encouraged me to skip class all the time and go eat lunch with her. Um, I do not think that's true. That is very true. And that's my that's my funny story. And anyway, so she went back to law school and followed her dream. But you, when whenever we were little, you new people who were super involved in adoption and then you went to school and became an adoption attorney and now you're still in connection with those people and then I adopted so kind of walk us through that and just like I mean I know that you think it's super cool that that's all kind of come full circle um yeah we went uh when you guys were were little and we lived in Little Rock I went to we all went to First Baptist Church part of the homeschool group there and um a pretty close-knit church family and um one of the people that we went to church with was christy Irwin, and she is um with project zero and i just remember even when uh y'all were little uh she had children close to y'all's ages but she always had usually an infant it was usually a baby that they were fostering i didn't know anything really about the foster system back then at all And it was just really, um, I'll just never forget thinking, wow, she opens her home up to these people she doesn't know. And even infants that you don't, that she doesn't know um, and takes care of them. And I remember hearing her talk one time about uh, when one of the babies got adopted um, and was ready to go home to their, uh, you know, to their forever home and how hard that was for her. Um, but still what a joyous time too, because she was, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the whole goal is to, um, to help these children find their forever home. So anyway, that has always stuck with me. You're right. We were so busy, um, homeschooling and that's really my, I have a huge heart for homeschooling. I feel like, um, that's such a blessing to families and I didn't want to work outside the house or, do anything that took too much time away from that. So I was a medical transcriptionist and worked from home, as you know, um, until uh, we moved down to Northwest Arkansas. And y'all, all uh, all three kids were older, and I was finally able to go back to law school, uh, finish school, and then go to law school because we were close to the University of Arkansas down here. So that was a big blessing that I got. All three of y'all and and dad all supported me, and uh, that was just a huge blessing. I made it through that, and so, you know, this has just been a kind of a dream for a long time, and now I get to play such a part in those adoption stories and see see people and, I mean, see kids from the, that have gone through the foster system and that are getting to be adopted and see their forever home, so that's... uh, I feel like I, I feel like I'm I'm living the dream in that way. Yeah, you get to be a part of you know the best day of their lives in some cases, and that's super awesome. And you you mentioned earlier just about deferring divorce cases to counselors, and you get paid like nothing for that, right? So I mean, the fact that that's you know I feel like lawyers get. Uh, a bad rap sometimes for (laughs) putting putting salary above people's feelings and i can say from experience you do not do that and that's just super awesome no i have have people ask me so often you know how can you divorce people and and everybody has a different story and some people um you know are hurting in different ways but if there's ever somebody that comes to me and it's you know when you pray for something like that you'd be surprised at who god brings through your door 
And uh, fortunately, we have some great Christian counselors here. And so that is, when I get to do that, it is um, absolutely wonderful. And I ask them to follow up with me and the counselors follow up. And, you know, when they get, when they stay in counseling and work things out and don't call me back to file that petition for divorce, then it's, um, it's just a huge, a huge blessing. Yay. Okay. So now we kind of get into the, the heart of the matter. I wanted to ask you just what you, I mean, I know that a lot of my desk, my guests, excuse me, I ask them about just their adoption journey, but your adoption journey, so to speak, is a little bit different in that it's, uh, it's been alongside ours. So I just kind of want to ask what your journey has been through our adoptions. Um, well, uh, I think the first, the first thing is, is, um, you know, it's so exciting when, when you, well, you've had the heart to adopt older children since you were in high school. And so seeing that and, and, and seeing you just follow that, that call is, has been just huge. And when you were able to connect with, with Christy or when with Project Zero and kind of start that journey yourself that's such a, a huge blessing to put as a grandparent you know as a parent to see to see first of all your child follow their dream and or follow their calling you know when they really see God working that out but second of all it's it's um like in y'all's case you know of course there's always those those thoughts that oh my gosh they haven't been married very long and oh my gosh they want an older child that's going to be so hard you don't want your children's lives to ever be difficult and and wait, what if this is something I can't fix as a parent? And so all those thoughts run through, run, ran through our heads, you know. And then when we see God uh, just work everything out in the way that he does it, it's just such a joy that we get to observe that and be a part of it. And um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's just been a huge blessing for us to watch the whole process. But um, let's talk about some of those fears. So, I mean, I know that specifically when we got Rock, I know that you guys, it's not, and it has nothing to do with Rock because it was before you even met him, but you guys had a lot of apprehension. Again, not that, I mean, you, you've you never overstepped in the way that you felt like it was your decision to make, but I know that you were scared for me, you know, your baby to, to go through those hard things. And so uh, walk us through some of those fears. Um, well, there's all kinds of fears. I mean, because, uh, we have never, because we're coming or I'm coming, dad and I both are coming from a standpoint that we don't really know. We haven't adopted, we haven't fostered, we don't really know the process. And so to have to watch one of our kids go through a long process and something that's unknown and, and a little bit scary because, um, you know, it, it, you know, most of these children, they're in foster care for a reason. And it's scary to think, wait a minute, what kind of problems are you going to have to help um, to help not even fix, but just manage and, and love these kids through? And it's hard because, um, I mean, it's hard from our standpoint, not knowing and not being able to say, wait a minute, are you sure you want to do that? And we may have, we may have messed up and said that a few times, but, <laughs> you know, but it's as, as a parent, as a parent, it's just really hard um, to think that, that you were, uh, that you might be getting into something that was going to be difficult and, and that was going to be, uh, like I said, unknown to me and dad. And so, uh, and unknown to you. And we had to just trust that God was leading all, all the way through that. And um, and it was also just a huge joy uh, for us to watch you and Brian together, you know, go on this journey together and um, and and just know that God was calling you and God was putting it. He put all the pieces together and it was great for us to be able to watch. But again, just the main the main fear was the unknown, the unknown of what what that child that God brought to you, what that child was going to uh, where he had come from and uh, what he thought about family and would he like us, you know, we're grandparents, we're a close family. What if he, what if he didn't click with us, you know, or, or he or she, I mean, it was just, there were just so many unknowns and so many apprehensions. It was hard because we were also, you're our oldest child. And it was also hard because we were still learning how to be parents, not only to adult children, but to married, you know, a married child. 
And that's hard enough where you have to sit back and go, wait a minute, we can't tell her these things. <laughs> you know. And, um, and so couple that with something that you're getting into that we are unfamiliar with. There's all kinds of apprehensions and fears. And uh, I don't know if fear is the right word. I mean, I guess it is, but just kind of um, a little skepticism that, uh, wait a minute, could God really be calling them to do this if it's going to be difficult? You know, is it, is it going to be more than they can handle? Well, of course not, because God can, you know, God's leading them to it. He can lead them through it. But again, it was so many unknowns for us. So as grandparents and as your parents, it was very, it was, it was scary. Yeah. It still is a little bit, you know? Well, and I, I want to walk you through some scenarios because I feel like the people listening, I'm, would would really benefit from some maybe specific examples. And we pride ourselves on honesty here on this podcast. So it's honesty from me and sharing some of these specifics, but honesty from you on how you felt through those. Um, okay. And I think that, I mean, the first one is, you know, I call it the white picket fence dream. You know, we, we technically, we have one boy, one girl biologically. And, you know, was there ever a morning on your part of, of seeing your kids live that just American dream of like a super normal family? Um, you mean, is that what we kind of, is that what we like, is that what you hoped for? Was there a little bit of disappointment when, when your family wasn't going to be normal when, when we weren't just going to have the, you know, American dream type, type family? You know, I think there was some part, I guess I I didn't think of it as kind of as in those words really, but it was kind of, um, you know, kind of going back to what I said a while ago about how, you know, there was concern about, you know, how another child would fit into our family overall. You know, we were, we were so close, all of us, and we have a pretty large family. And uh, so those kind of apprehensions and, yeah, it, you know, I, those thoughts to go along with that, the thought that possibly, uh, what if they don't? Is it going to be, uh, you know, are there going to be holidays? Are there going to be times that, that y'all can't join us because you may have a child that doesn't like us or, that doesn't like crowds or that is uncomfortable around one of our other kids or, you know, it, so yeah, those things do, do happen. I mean, those things did go through our minds, of course, and not necessarily the, just the, you know, one boy, one girl, white picket fence, but just something, an outsider coming in more, you know, yes, mm-hmm. it would have been every, we, we seem to have the perfect family, perfect dynamics in so many ways. And, um, not that anything's perfect like that. I don't mean that, but, you know, having an outsider come in, all those thoughts of, is it going to fit into our, our whole family dynamic? And that was, that was a, actually, that was a thought, you know, those, those, uh, that is part of it. Right. And, you know, we, we have had those experiences. I mean, you've, and this brings us to another scenario, you know, our oldest son that we've adopted has not always been uh, kind to your baby girl. So, I mean, yeah. how have, how have you dealt with that? You know, when he's run away or he's yelled at me or he's called me names or something like that. And, and there was that disconnect there. And I mean, where, what was your place as a grandparent? How did you feel in those situations? Um, I, I felt a, a million different, different emotions, you know, anger first. And, um, and this is where, you know, God really puts uh, puts people together in marriage for a reason. And, and just talking to dad about that, you know, he handled those situations in the best way, uh, best way possible. Whereas I don't think I would have, you know, that's where, you know, mama bear comes out. <laughs> and, and I don't think if I had been uh, close to him at that time, uh, you know, when he was acting out and doing those things and calling you names, and if I'd been present, I probably would not have handled that in the best way. But, um, but pop was, you know, dad and, and he, and, and he was able to calm him down and talk to him the couple of times that he was, you know, he was able to, to go over to your house and, and talk to him. Um, it does, that's really hard. Anger is probably the first, the first feeling, the first reaction from me. And, uh, after that, you know, of course you've got to, I think it, Knowing the background now, you know, those feelings quickly go to just kind of some empathy and some uh, some realization that this is not all of his fault. But it took a, it took a, a while to get there. I mean, when I say a while, over a year for me to get to that point where I could look past the anger and or kind of get past that and start realizing that, you know, what can we do how can we help him work through this in a safe environment for our baby girl and our grandbabies? 
And, um, you know, again, and then it comes back to also where that's not our decision. It's not, um, and we don't want to overstep our bounds by saying, you know, by saying what we think, how we think it should be handled, that our main um, thought processes and our main goals uh, in being grandparents and being parents in that regard are protecting our babies. Right. And, uh, and you're one of those babies. <laughs> so. Right. Well, I mean, and your, your job is to support, to support me and Brian, um, my husband through all of this. And I mean, that kind of brings it to that. Like, what, what do you, what did you see? I mean, I've, I've, will say it again and I've said it a bunch, but I feel like you often know me better than I know myself. And I think that's just the, <laughs> the parent, uh, mantra. But I mean, what do you think that I have, have needed? How have you seen me change? And what do you think that I've needed from you through this? Um, I think you've needed a lot of assurance that, that, you know, you are, that it was a calling, uh, that it still is a calling that, that this is still what, uh, what God has for you. And I think a lot of assurance that God's going to be strong and he's, he's big enough to do this. And, um, I think uh, it seems to me, you know, again, we're on, on kind of the outside a little bit, but as your parent and as a grandparent, I think a lot of, a lot of what you've needed is, is kind of someone to say, take a deep breath and, and, you know, let me, let me come over and just, just give you a hug or, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't, you've never asked, you know, to, for me to take this away from you, you know, for me to take the burden on, because that's something you've always handled with such grace. Uh, but I think I feel like um, in that, just like in anything else, I feel like what you've needed and what the best thing that I could have done in so many, so many days, you know, was um, was to say, you know what, your God's God still got this and you're still doing the right thing. Um, it's hard. And sometimes uh, I think you've needed to get the big perspective because dealing with it day in and day out. And inside, uh, in the house, you know, the fact that you had three babies while dealing with a difficult teenager, um, I think, you know, I think you, you kind of needed the, the bigger perspective and sometimes just to get out of the house. Sometimes just to realize that, that to, just a reminder that the bigger picture is still God's overall goal for this child and for your family and for you. And I think the more um, chaos that there has been, the harder it is for you to see that that overall perspective. Yeah, I think that's really I think that's really good. Um, okay, so just in continuing with these situations, you know, we've talked a little bit about Clark and his um, his issues are completely separate from Rock, who is our other adopted son. And I plan on doing an episode with my husband later on that just talks a little bit more specifically about um, our story. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, Rock, his situation, we got him as a baby and you had to watch me while being giant pregnant, taking care of a baby who was going through severe (laughs) drug withdrawal. And that was really, really, really hard. And now he still has some, just a few issues, you know, and, and he's, I guess, shall we say he's just a difficult child in general. He's a little bit harder than my biological children while still, you know, being our baby. So, I mean, how is that, how has that been just dealing with a kid who's not easy or normal or whatever you want to call it? And being um, the grandparent there and walking me through that because he's still a baby, yeah. you know, you still have some expertise in the baby department, probably not in the, the drug withdrawing baby department, though. Right, right, right. Um, I think the, uh, the, the probably the worst thing was just knowing that you were pregnant when you uh, when Rock came. And uh, not only that, but you had Grady, who was uh, still so young. And, uh, so again, it was just watching, watching my baby go through some difficult times. And I think the worst time was when you made a comment one time that, um, how selfish someone had to be to put their baby through this. And that was kind of an eye opener for me. Um, I think just as, as just someone who has never been in that, uh, I've never dealt with babies on anybody in drug withdrawal or anything like that. But I remember when you said that, that y'all had been up just about all night for a week and, um, and how selfish that you didn't, 
you were having to help this baby through this. You didn't cause it, but the woman who had caused it had just caused it and left. And that really, I don't know, I've never forgotten when you said that. It was really hard for me to watch you and Brian um, not have any sleep, not have any rest, and having to be up all night while this baby cried and um, and detox from these drugs. And that was hard. And then, um, you know, now just knowing that he's he's that he still has some struggles and he's doing so great and he's so happy. And now the biggest joy is just knowing that, you know, he's where he is because he has been so loved by y'all. And what a what a joyous child. I mean, what a he's just awesome, you know, and y'all have loved him through it. Yeah. So that was it was it was very hard for me to watch uh, to watch that to just to know that that his struggles were not his fault and he's overcome so much in his short little life. And it's, uh, you know, God's just used you and Brian to pull him, to pull him together. And now he's doing great. Well, and, and I just have to brag on you a little bit. Um, this is just a side note, but rock it, uh, maybe aside from mommy and daddy, <laughs> you go by Gigi and you are by far his favorite person. <laughs> <laughs> and when I do something that he doesn't like, you know, like wipe his nose or change his diaper, or just, you know, all those terrible things, he always <laughs> tattles to Gigi, who is not even in the room, but he'll just turn and be like, Gigi, Gigi, <laughs> and it's like all day long. And I'll text her and be like, Rock's tattling to you again. And anyway, it's just really cute to see that bond. And, and let's talk about that. Let's talk about biology a little bit, because I know that we've, you know, we've already covered that this is not necessarily like when we were little, this probably wasn't your vision for my life, but we're here now and you have two non-biological grandkids and I watch you love them so fiercely. And I know that that couldn't have been natural because it wasn't natural for me. What, what has been your process to, to get where you are now with them? You know, it really was more natural than I ever thought it would be. Um, even with Clark, it's just, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, one of the neatest things about Clark has just been getting to know him, you know, getting to know what his interests are and all of that. It has not been, um, it has not been difficult. It has not been a trial. It has not been, um, anything at all to, to love them. Now, when the anger comes in, it's very, it's very hard, but I don't think there's ever been a time that we didn't love them as our grandkids. And that is just, I mean, that is, that's God, you know, God has put them, he's made them. They feel like part of our family and there's just no difference there. Um, as far as, like I said, Clark's Clark's a little bit different. He's hard. He's hurt you and he's hurt Brian. And that's, that does make it harder. But, um, God's slow. God is, uh, I say slowly, it's really kind of quickly taken away the anger, um, or my quick reaction to anger when, when he has these episodes and we're just praying that, He'll get through that quickly. He deserves to work through his his trauma and his hurt. And I just, God has been quick to bring to my mind more, I guess, quicker and quicker um, that this is not his fault, that that his issues, uh, he doesn't know how to handle them appropriately. And I think that's just by God's grace that he gives us that perspective. And it's getting it's getting quicker and quicker that, that my anger turns to, you know, those feelings. But uh, you know, it's just, it's, um, yes, it's hard to love him when he's hurting one of my babies. Absolutely. Um, but as far as, uh, being non-biological, it's, that has not been, that's just not been a thought at all. Wow. And I think that's so, that's, I think that that's going to be so great for people to hear, especially grandparents or just family support systems in general, because I know that so many, so many people have apprehensions just about bringing, you know, quote unquote strangers into their family and accepting them yep. as their own. And I think it's such a good perspective to hear that it's not as scary as maybe you thought it would be. Not that you were super scared, but just that it was a lot more natural than you anticipated. It really was. And like, I mean, that, yeah, that's one, like I said a while ago, that was one of the things that, that was, that was a little scary, you know, with this, with this child like us, would they fit into our family? Would they kind of click? Would they, you know, would they click with the other kids and would they like us as grandparents? And all of those are fear, you know, they're all, they're all thoughts. They're all, you know, apprehensions that certainly went through our mind. And, and, um, but, you know, I don't know. I just, I remember the first time when, um, when 
I think one of the first times when Clark came over to our house and we had not put the trampoline up yet. And Sierra had asked dad to put the trampoline up several times. And he said, you know, oh, well, eventually. And it was literally sitting on the side of the house. And Clark came over and he said, y'all have a trampoline? And dad had it up within about, you know, 15 minutes or whatever. And Sierra (laughs) said, are you kidding me? And he said, he's a grand. (laughs) <laughs> and, and so, you know, that, it, that was, I think the first time that he was at our house and, um, and, and it just, it, you know, it just, he just, I don't know, it just fit in not, you know, that, like I said, that was the first time there's been more difficult times, but I, I, I just, the God's been very gracious to, to give us that, the open arms to welcome him. And even when, um, you know, even when I've had to have a hard talk with, with Clark about hurting my baby girl and and uh, things like that, you know, it's still God has still given us the love for him as a grandchild. And uh, that's, that's something that can only come from God. You know, when somebody hurts your, hurts your baby, it's so easy to hang on to that anger. Mm-hmm. And we've been able to, um, I mean, God has just has just given us the open arms for him. And the, the, I think the perspective to just see, like I said a while ago, that it's not his fault. So we, they, we've definitely, um, you know, definitely seen, seen the bad side and the good side. And, and like I said, the good wins, it's just God's grace is, is abound, abounds all the time. And, and especially in a situation like that, when you have a trauma child, I would say to anybody, especially a grandparent, you know, who may be dealing with something like that. Yes, it's hard. It's hard to see your baby hurt, but just you know, know that God's got it. And I think the, like I said, the biggest thing that we, that God does for us is just make, help us realize that he didn't ask for this. He didn't ask for the trauma he's been through. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can stay, stay with that perspective and realize that we're, we're God's using, you know, us and y'all and everybody in this family to help him through this. And God's got a bigger plan. And to be a part of that plan is a blessing. And we just have to keep that perspective all the time. Yeah. Wow. That's really, um, that's really good insight. And I feel like, I mean, you and I talk about this stuff a lot and I feel like the conversation is usually one-sided. It's me venting to you or crying to you (laughs) or whatever, but I feel like we never get to have this kind of dialogue just about your experience. And it's really good for me to hear too. Um, you know, and, and on that note, you know, I had some questions written down and, and one of them was just what, how has your experience changed? you know, within our experience, uh, how has it changed your perspective on adoption? And I feel like, um, I feel like you've already answered that a little bit. So maybe nutshell it, but also I, I want to ask, you know, how is your, how is your opinion on trauma? Cause I, I, you know, before we really got into this, we had, we had no idea about trauma or the extent of it or the psychology of it or how to deal with it. And I know that you probably didn't either, you know, you're older than me, so you're wiser than me, but still, this is a, this is a new thing for all of us. So maybe, um, and I, and I know that, you know, it took a while for Clark to start showing some of his true colors to you guys, certainly after he showed them to us. And it's not that you didn't believe me, but it's just that you had no, you had no eyes for that yet. You know, you had right. never seen it with from anyone else and certainly not him. So maybe how has your perspective on that stuff changed on trauma? You know, when you finally did start to see it and you're like, oh, everything you've been telling me for the past six months suddenly makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it does. And there's not, a, there's not ever a time that we doubted you at all. You know, when we would hear these stories, not ever, but um, I think we were, uh, or I was especially just a little bit shocked that, that, um, you know, wait a minute, you can't, you can't discipline him and, and fix this problem. And, and I think you were, I remember you saying, but mom, that's how you disciplined us or that that's how you raised us. And, and I thought, man, he's not, he's just not uh, responding the same. What's the problem here? You know? And then, um, when, uh, Rebecca Price came over and kind of helped you, you know, realize the insight of what, uh, you know, what kids really, what, what, what kids really look like that have been through trauma, I, I had no idea. And I think that that's when, you know, your eyes open also that no wonder he responds differently. There's absolutely no biological way that he can respond the same, which means there's no biological way that he can think the same way as other kids his age. There's no way that he can um, control himself the way other kids his age do. And when you think of it from that standpoint, 
it's uh, it's hard. It's sad. It's really sad. And there's then, you know, there's all these feelings of anger for the people who who put him in this position. Um, I certainly have learned volumes and, and, and I'm not even even close to learning everything about the trauma brain. But the more that I, I that God brings people into my life, even that are experienced in this area and say, you know, they're able just to validate everything and say, oh, my gosh, no, he'll never, you know, he needs so much help for people who are trained, trained to, to treat this. And thank goodness that, um, I mean, God has trained people to deal with this. But it was really hard uh, coming from a standpoint that I didn't know anything about it. Uh, Dad and I, neither one did. And, and having to think, wait a minute, we've got all these years of experience as a parent and, None of this seems to be working, you know? Okay, what's what's wrong here? And we just had no idea. Yeah. Well, and walk me through walk me through the maybe the moment or the time or the situation where where that shifted in your mind, where you made that realization that, you know, the whole game has changed here and um, you know, traditional parenting isn't going to work for my child, you know, everything I've modeled for her my whole life isn't going to work anymore. And and you know, I have to support her through this completely new situation that nobody's familiar with. And um, I mean, was there a moment like that where it just clicked and where you realized that um, this was different? Um, I think probably I can't I can't remember one specific moment, but I can remember. Excuse me. I can't remember. The main thing was about the lying. Mm -hmm. And and when I realized and, and I think, you know, you had read up and I talked to people and and had discussed this and, and, and become so much more educated on it about his need as a, um, as a, as a, you know, victim of trauma, uh, his need to please everybody. That such an immediate reaction to lie at whatever the cost, tell anybody what they want to hear, no matter what the cost. And it's such an instinct. But I, I guess I remember, I think I even said to you one time, well, you need to call him on those lies and the fact that it didn't make any difference, that he didn't care. And it took me several months of seeing that to realize that he really didn't care. It was all self-preservation. It was, I mean, whatever he had to do at the moment to, you know, to, to maintain peace for himself. And, and, and quite that, literally, I mean, for his mind to stay alive, you know, that's how he was thinking yeah, about it. Yeah. And, and that broke my heart once you kind of explained that to me. And then the more that you became educated and, and talked to me about it. And the more I talk to people, I mean, it's just, um, it, it, now it's just saddens me that so many people are unaware that these children are going to the schools with, with other children. They are in classrooms with teachers that are, that do not yet know, you know, how these children think. And, and not that they even know, they don't even need to know what the kids have been through, but they need to know that if one of these children has been in a situation with trauma, that they cannot be expected to learn or to talk or to make friends or to do anything like other children. And, um, and I say children, I mean, he's 16 now. And, um, and, and he was 14 when he came into, to our family. And even at that point, you think, well, that's, you know, an age where he can kind of adapt and work through this. No, I mean, it's, it, it's not, it takes, it takes a long time and, and probably, um, a lifetime, so to speak, but hopefully, um, hopefully he's getting the help he needs and, and that can stop. But I think, I think dealing with the lying was probably that the moment or the, the issue that woke me up to realize that this is not going to be a normal, a normal parenting adventure. Right. The, the, the structure and, um, discipline are not going to, not going to work as well as we thought Right, right. <laughs> with enough love and care, any child, right? That's what, that's really what we thought, you know? And, um, and I remember thinking, Oh, well, you know what? He, that won't happen again because we talked to him and he'll be fine now. And, and now I look back and I think of that and like, Oh my goodness, that was so silly to think that, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, as a grandparent, especially, uh, we didn't know those things. You know, we didn't know why something wouldn't work that it had worked for, you know, 30 years or 27 years or, you know, why would it not work on this child? Um, but again, I, I think that there's so much need for education and, 
and as grandparents, I wish there was kind of like a grandparent class that, that people could go through, you know, to, uh, to kind of learn about, um, you know, about what to expect. But I keep you telling know. you that you should hold some sort of seminar and do that. <laughs> um, and I wanted to specify just for those listening, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times about um, conversations that you and, and dad or John to whoever's listening, have, you know, conversations that you've had with Clark specifically, just because Rock is not old enough for that. And I don't I doubt that he will need this kind of situation when he's that age. But I wanted to specify that. Those talks were given with our permission. Um, you guys didn't yeah. cross those bounds. But on our part, we wouldn't have given that permission had you not had this wake up call that we're talking about. Had you have, you know, still stood by that traditional method and said, like, I don't care. He just needs a good spanking or whatever and not changed your viewpoint. We would right. not right. have been OK with that. But it was because you um, became the support system that we needed, not maybe not to speak in Batman terms, uh, maybe not the support <laughs> system that you wanted to be. We were, you know, we w- we felt more comfortable with calling in the troops, so to speak, whenever we felt so weary where we were like, I, you know, I throw my hands in the air. You're going to have to talk to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that, and, and, and that's a very good point that we would, we would never have, um, have stepped in, you know, without, without the okay from you. you, you and Brian have been so strong and have handled everything with such grace. And, and even when I know that y'all are completely weary and um, completely kind of at your, at your last straw, not knowing what to do, y'all have still handled it. You've still stepped up and handled it. And um, this is a, this such a, um, if you look, just look at how many worlds are colliding into one moment, you know, um, it's just it, there's no right or wrong way. It, it's so difficult to find what will work, or you know, it's. But I mean, what you're trying to do is find how to how do I love this child the way that God wants me to love him. And uh, anytime I think anytime you adopt, but especially a child that's been through trauma, and trying to find that uh, is is not always a oh okay this is it this is the answer, you know. Right. And <laughs> it's a different day. And you and Brian do such a great job at that. And like I said, once God God is has has is is taken away the the mama bear quicker and quicker when these things have happened, and uh, and I think that's I think honestly what um, I think what what helps Clark or what I hope helps is that he knows that such a big family loves him and we all love him, and that's what I've tried to to really uh, you know hone in on uh, when we when we do talk to him is that there's nothing he can do that are going to make us not be his family anymore and I want to reassure him of that that even though I can be upset with him because he's hurt my baby girl I still love him and you know what God's still got a great plan for his life that this is just one of those times he messed up and we've talked to him what maybe two or three times and only after y'all have given us the go ahead to do that and I really feel not that we helped solve the problem, but that he listened. And I just feel like if he can take away the fact that we, we love him, we're not going to stand back. You know, we're going to be active and we're going to actively love him. I hope that that will play a part in just helping him gain some, some confidence, some self-esteem back and just some security. Yeah, absolutely. That's, it's a good word, mama. Um, Okay, so what has another question? So, what has been the most difficult thing about supporting us? And maybe you've already answered that, but if, again, if you just want to kind of nutshell it, probably um, well, <laughs> probably not knowing how to uh, <laughs> in, the, in the beginning has been the most difficult, and and uh, probably just not knowing how not not being able to fix it when you are tired i've seen i've seen you guys just completely completely weary completely worn out and i think uh you know that's when i wish i i wish i had more time just to say you know what let me let me come over let me stay at your house you guys go away for the weekend or something like that and i know that that's probably a huge need all the time um and not one that 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 we had the time to meet all the time right now. But um, I'd say that's, that's probably one of the hardest things is I think that's a big support that y'all need or that any adoptive and, or fostering uh, family needs. Um, I think the other thing is just knowing that uh, 
that I that I couldn't fix. I couldn't fix it. That when when things were when you were having a bad day and it was uncomfortable when you had three babies and uh, in a teenager and by yourself at home and things were not going well and I could not fix that situation. Yeah. And that's really been the hardest thing is not knowing how to support you in that. But I think, you know, when, when we can and when we can either offer encouragement or, you know, meet some physical needs, uh, of course, that's the, I feel like we can help in that way. But when I think the hardest thing is when it's not possible, when we can't fix the situation right away. Yeah, no, that's good. Okay, so my last question for you is kind of a um – it's a little bit of a twofold. So it's, it's an advice question. So what's your biggest piece of advice or encouragement for a families and specifically grandparents of adoptive families who need support, but B um, maybe grandparents who are at the beginning of this journey, who have kids that are considering adoption and they're scared, something like that. So you can pick which one you want to answer first. <laughs> <laughs> What was the first one again? <laughs> well, let's start with actually. Let's start with my last one. So, what would you say to grandparents okay. whose kids are um, considering adoption or thinking about fostering or just something like that? And maybe the grandparents are like, "I don't know what this is going to look like," and it freaks me out. What what encouragement or advice do you have for those people? I would say, um, I would say, you know, pray pray that uh, that God's going to bring the right child. And then trust in that, you know, pray that, that if you've had children that are wanting to adopt and that God's going to, going to take them through that, if they called them to do it, that God's going to bring the right child into that, into your family. And you've got to trust in that then. Um, I would say, uh, you know, not to have any expectations about what it's going to look like because, you know, God has a great sense of humor and God's going to make it look like something that you've never expected. Oh yeah. (laughs) And (laughs) and so to, to be ready, ready for anything. But, um, I think, you know, mainly we've, we've never thought of, of them, of Clark and Rock as anything, but our grandchildren. And, uh, and I think just to, to be anticipate, anticipate that, that these are going to be grandchildren and, that God's going to give you the love for them. Pray for that love and, and pray for God to give all great. As a grandparent, we need to pray for wisdom all the time on how to be a grandparent, how not to be um, an overstepping parent in their, uh, in the lives of their parents, you know, our children, but to be the, the wisdom to be the right grandparent for these kids. And there's a difference there. And sometimes that's a fine line and it's hard. But um, I would say the biggest piece of advice for um, for someone whose children are looking into and following along this journey and getting ready to adopt is don't have any preconceived notions of what that's going to look like. Be open for whatever God brings. Yeah. Oh, wise stuff. Okay. So then the second part of that question was, what would you say? So, so for grandparents or family members or whoever, um, whatever family support system looks like, that are maybe in that position that you were, where where they're walk like a surgeon walking into a car crash victim, and they don't really know where to start, but everything yes. just chaotic and broken. Um, so they're just freaked out, and they're like, "I don't know how to fix it," and everything's wrong. And uh, so, what what advice or encouragement do you have for them? Um, you know, I think. <laughs> I think mainly just um, just having the right perspective and uh, maybe not be so uh, not not try to have any preconceived notions of anything, not um, not have, uh, you know, not have any certain any anything that you think it's, it has to look like. Yeah. Um, so that help can look that help can look different for each person, but you know, how would you suggest that, that specifically grandparents, I mean, we're, we're mainly talking about that, but how would yeah. you suggest that they decipher where they're needed, where, um, because I mean, I, I feel like it was kind of trial and error for us, you know, it was yeah. like, you know, other people are providing meals. So what can I do? And, and so how do you figure, how do you suggest that they find where they're needed and what to do? I think first, I think first of all, any physical needs, I mean, like, like, you know, like you, I know that y'all needed sleep and I know that there were times that, that I had for the next day that I couldn't just be up and be up all night and let y'all sleep. But, you know, and you have such gracious friends and such awesome people that God provided so many meals for y'all. 
And that was such a great physical help. So that opened, that freed us up to do other things, you know, where, whether it was taking one child or taking one baby, um, you know, while you, uh, just to give you a little bit of a break or to take the teenager, you know, and, um, and even just to go get yogurt or something, uh, you know, it was, it's easy to see, it's easy as to see and meet physical needs. But the other thing is, um, and what was hard for me, I guess, is when, when I knew that you would call me during the day and I couldn't answer the phone and I knew you probably just needed just to talk a little bit, have some adult conversation and say, I need to hear some, I need to hear the, the right perspective on this. And that was really hard. But I think that, um, that finding that help that your kids need emotionally as they go through this is the hardest because you're, you know, you, you are, you can verbalize well, you know, that your needs, but there are some kids that don't even know where to start to describe what they might need in this situation. So as grandparents, uh, I would say, you know, first of all, look for the physical needs that you can meet. And if those are already being met, then I mean, anything at all, but always ask, always ask, what can I do? What can I do? Yeah. And I would add on to that, you know, one of the biggest blessings for me, and I know that this is like, just so boring for you, but there are, there are a lot of times when I just need you to like, come sit with me in the chaos. Like yeah. if I'm super overwhelmed, <laughs> even if you don't do anything, even if you just sit on the bar stool and like talk to me or tell me what I should be doing or something. Sometimes yeah. it just helps me to go on autopilot and not feel so drained from having to think about all the things. And, um, and that's just been a really big deal for me just, and I know that not everyone has that close of access to their parents. You know, they might live somewhere else or something like that, but it's just been such a big blessing on my life for you to just come over sometimes and like ground me, like make oh. me feel, make me feel not alone and like, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's, I think that's the case. Um, so often is, is especially when you are, when you, especially in your situation where you had three babies and a teenager and you literally were inside, you know, through the winter with the, with three babies. And, uh, yeah. and that was, that was really, well, actually two babies for a while, I guess, but you know, that was really hard uh, on you. And I knew that. And sometimes whenever you see, whenever you see your kids or anyone going through that, sometimes they do just want people to go through it with them and, and that's why, you know, some, I felt like hopefully if I could just stop by, if I can't be available all the time by phone, if I could, you know, come by, you know, feed a baby or hold a baby, you know, or something, you know, and, and have some adult conversation, you know, I, I hope that that, that that would be a help. Um, but again, that's one of those emotional, uh, those emotional uh, needs that need to be met that are harder for grandparents to see unless, unless, you know, they're verbalized. So I would say that it was a grandparent always ask, what can I do? What can I do to help? Yeah. And uh, because you know, it's not always going to be a parent. Yeah. Oh, well, this has been wonderful as always. I just love talking to you and I have the blessing mm -hmm. to get to talk to you often. And I'm so excited that <laughs> everyone else gets to hear your wisdom because of course I think you're just like, you know, the super mom and the best mom in the entire world. So, um, you hopefully other people will agree, although, you know, they might be biased toward their own mothers and that's fine, <laughs> but you're just pretty awesome. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with my podcast listeners. And so where can we find you on like social media, your practice, et cetera? Um, you, I have a, I'm on Facebook. It's Andrea McCurdy. And then, um, my my office phone is 479-439-8881. And if there's anybody listening, they are welcome to call me anytime or to email me at Andrea D. McCurdy at gmail.com anytime at all. And sometimes even as grandparents, like I said, one of the just being one of the one of the primary struggles is not knowing what to do and not uh, not knowing how to help. And, um, and I'm willing, you know, I'll talk to anybody who needs, who needs some guidance there. Not that I can offer a lot of guidance, but sometimes just talking to another grandparent does help and, um, and, and call me or, uh, email me anytime. And I just want to say before we close that, you know, you and Brian have just been the picture of, of grace and, and strength and going through this together and, um, and the fact that y'all are so open about the struggles has been a blessing to us as, as parents. And, um, and I think to everybody who is able, who, who has the blessing just to watch y'all go through this journey. And, uh, we just, we thank the world of y'all and just think that y'all are doing an awesome job. Well, thanks mama. 
<laughs> and um, thank you for being on my podcast. And I'm sure I'll, you know, talk to you extremely soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I love right. you. Bye. You too. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Adoptive Mom Podcast. I know this stuff is hard and I hope you found encouragement here. Remember, you are enough and you're doing a great job. God wants to be at the center of this journey and he is big enough to redeem all of our mistakes. Don't forget to check out show notes and other resources at the Podcast.com. Thanks again for listening.